Hi, I'm Roger Copeland, pastor of Northern Hills Baptist Church. Who is Northern Hills Baptist Church? We are you. We are everyday people who love our families, who are seeking direction in life. We are teachers, doctors, bankers. We are your next door neighbor. We want you to be a part of these exciting times at Northern Hills Baptist Church. Hey, God's Word, please, and open it this morning to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. The book of Joshua, chapter 4. This morning, I want to speak to you about the, the rocks of remembrance. We all need some rocks of remembrance in our lives. And the reason is because we are so prone to forget things that really matter. Uh, and I can illustrate that uh, succinctly. We remember a crude joke, but not what the sermon was about last Sunday. We have the tendency to forget things that matter most. We need because we're weak. We need because we are frail human beings. We need rocks of remembrance in our lives. Look with me now in Deuteronomy chapter, or in Joshua rather, chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1. Joshua chapter 4 and verse number 1. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. Command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. Joshua spake unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, say, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. The children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they had lodged and laid them down there. Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood. And they are there unto this day. Our Father in heaven, we pray now that you'll bless the preaching of your word. We pray for those who are without Christ, those who are in this service, and those who will watch this service by other means. If they've never been to, to, to Jesus in salvation, we pray that they will come to receive him as their Lord and Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. When we come to the fourth chapter of the book of Joshua, we find that Captain Joshua is there with the children of Israel, and they are on the other side of the Jordan River. They have uh, been set free from uh, Egyptian bondage, and they have passed through the blood, and they have been liberated and set free. They have spent 40 scorching years in the wilderness, wandering aimlessly, they have come now to the swollen waters of the Jordan. God has performed a miracle, and the children of Israel have walked over on dry ground. They are finally in the promised land. Behind them are the chains of Egypt, the chains that reminded them of slavery and bondage, the chains that reminded them that they were not their own. They belonged to Egypt. 
behind them at the bottom of the Red Sea is the pursuing army of the Egyptians. Behind them are the countless bowls of manna and quail that their souls began to loathe. Behind them is the desert sun. Now they are where God wants them to be. And you say, well, that's a great story, but it has nothing at all to do with me. I would suggest to you that it has everything to do with you. Because the fact of the matter is that some in this building are in Egypt land. You are bound by the bonds of sin. You are the slave of sin. And you might kick and you might pull. But the fact of the matter is that you are bound by sin. It has a grip on your life. And it just might as well be real changed because the bondage is so real. You're down in Egypt land. But the others in this building, you know what? We have gone through the door that has been applied by the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And we are saved and we are washed and we do not belong to Egypt. We have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are saved. We are set free. We are not captives. We are children of God. Ah, but sometimes some of us in this building live in a desert land. We wander in a backslidden condition because of unbelief. We, we get caught up in the world, saved but backslidden. We get caught up in the passions of the flesh, saved but backslidden. And then God brings us to the swollen waters of the Jordan River. This is one of those watershed events in the life of every Christian where you come to the end of yourself and finally say, God, I God, I can't live the Christian life. I can't be a Christian. I can't do what Christians are supposed to do. But with you in me and by your power and by your grace, I will be a Christian. I will let live the Christian life by Christ living his life in me and through me. I will be a Christian. You see, at, there, there's got to be a place in life where we say, I'm at a point of no return. Either I'm going to go on with God. I'm going to fulfill his plan and his purpose for my life. I, at this point on, I am all of God's. And God can do in me. God can do through me. Whatever he will, because from this day forward, I'm his. Well, that's where the children of Israel were. They had come to a place where they're not turning back. They've come to a place where they're going forward. They're going to possess all the possessions that God has for them. They're at a place in their lives where they, they are willing to say, we are tired of wondering. We are tired of unbelief. We are tired of failure. This time, we are going on with God. And so they get on the other side. And God says to Joshua, tell them to get some stones. We're going to make a monument. And they'll never forget what happened at Gilgal. There's got to be some stones. Why? Why does there have to be stones? Why do they have to have a monument? Why do they have to have something that they can go back to and say, here's where it was. This is where it happened. I'm telling you why. Because Satan wants to steal every blessed and spiritual memory you have. Satan would love to come into your mind and, and uh, wipe clean the memory drive of your soul. Satan would come to love to come into your life and say to you, you know what that encounter you had with God, it wasn't real. You're not remembering it just exactly right. You know what you thought you were saved and, and that experience you had with Christ, but, but your memory is not right. We need some stones. We need a monument. We need a Gilgal that we can go back to and say, right, here's where it happened. This is where the work of God took place in my life. Three quick things, and I'm done. Number one, it needs to be a place of commemoration. I want you to look down in chapter 4 and verse 24. Chapter 4 and verse 24, that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord, it is mighty, that, that, and that ye might fear the Lord your God. Why I put these stones up? 
Because God said, I want these stones to be a testimony about my power. And I want it to generate fear and reverence in your hearts. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. This is a bona fide biblical miracle. You cannot explain it away. How that God got them across the waters of the, of the Jordan when it was swollen out of its banks. You can't explain that away apart from the power of God. Apart from the awesomeness of God. They got across because God is God. And he's a God of great power. But I want you to show, show you something. They were to reverence God. They were to fear God. Here's the problem, y'all. The problem is that the only time we want to reverence God is when we see some miraculous deed done by God. How about this? Why don't we reverence God simply because of who God is? Does your reverence for God have to be drawn out by some miraculous act of God? Does your reverence for God have to be prompted simply because God has been an exception, has been exceptionally good to you? How about reverence God? Because God is God. There is no God like our God. Let our hearts erupt with praise and worship to God because God is God. You know what? If the only time you have reverence for God is when, in your opinion, God's been good to you. You're not going to reverence God much. But if you reverence God because of who He is, His awesomeness, His greatness, His power, His glory, then all day long, every day, you can reverence God. Now, here's the point. They encountered God at the Jordan River. They encountered God. God showed up big. By the way, God can't show up little. God showed up big at the Jordan River. The children of Israel come across that Jordan. There's the priest of God proudly, triumphantly carrying the ark of God. And God showed up in the Jordan River. And when God shows up and when people have an encounter with God, their life is forever changed. You look at those that encountered God. They saw the glory of God and they were changed. There was, there was Moses on the backside of nowhere in Horeb. And there was a bush that was consumed with fire. And he said, I will turn aside and see this thing which has come to pass he came up on that burning bush and the Lord said to him take off thy shoes for the place where on thou standest is holy ground how did it change how did it change Moses he was hiding on the backside of a desert the burning bush experience he leaves there goes to the mightiest monarch of the world and says let my people go his encounter with God changed him. There was Jacob, and Jacob was a liar, uh, a deceiver. His name means supplanter. He was no good. He was rotten to the core. But he encountered God at Bethel, and God changed his name and took a liar and a thief and made a prince of God out of him. You can't encounter God without being changed. There was Saul of Tarsus, a murderer. He had letters in his pocket authorizing him to persecute and kill Christians. And he encountered the living Lord Jesus. And he became the mightiest preacher and missionary the world has ever known. You can't encounter God and not be changed. What I'm, I'm calling you out, what I'm doing. Those of you who say, well, I've, been, I've encountered the Lord. But I didn't change. You didn't encounter the Lord. So, well, what do you think is going on? Well, I think, number one, you're lying about it. Or you encountered a false Lord because when you encounter the Lord of the Bible, you are changed. So he said, put 12 stones. That was at Gilgal. They would come back to rest there. They would come back to be rejuvenated at Gilgal. You see, it was to be a, it was to be a place where they had an experience with God. And he said, put some stones there. Why do we need stones? Because we forget. I noticed in the book of Deuteronomy, the, the multiplicity of times that God says to them, do not forget. Listen to what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way. And then he said in another place, beware that you do not forget the Lord. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord, 
Here's the thing. The danger was not that they would forget they had come across the Jordan River. The danger is they would forget that it was God who did it. Amen. Sometimes we Christians are that way, aren't we? We want to take credit for stuff that only God can do. Now watch it. Build some stones. Generations to come are going to ask about these stones. Your children, your grandchildren are going to say, Pop, Pop, what's these stones about? Mamma, why do we have these stones? And not one of them would be able to say, well, you know, we were, we were trying to get across the Jordan and it was really flooded really bad. And, uh, you know, we just diverted and made a canal and got all that flood water off and we crossed over. No man would be able to say, well, son, I'm going to tell you what happened there. We, we, we came up with an ingenious plan and got us some sump pumps and we pumped all that water out and we got across. Instead, he would say, son, let me tell you, it was the most miraculous, awesome thing I've ever seen in my life. God's possession for us was across the swollen waters of the Jordan River. We had no idea what we were going to do, but God showed up and powerfully and miraculously and wonderfully, God dried up the waters and we marched across on dry ground. Only God can do that. See, what I'm telling you today is that there are some things in your life you can't take credit for them. There are some things that God has done that only God can do. Give Him the glory. Have a Gilgal. Have a pile of stones that says to this generation and the next generation, there are some things that only God can do. Give Him the glory for it. Well, it would be a place of commemoration. There, but secondly... It also would be a, a place of restoration. You know, every believer at some point or the other experiences discouragement. Sometime or the other we experience defeat. Our, our soul gets sad. And with the psalmist we say, oh, oh my soul, why art thou cast down within me? Why art thou disquieted? Our soul gets down. We get discouraged. I'm going to tell you what we need. Those times of discouragement, when our soul is disquieted, we need to pack up and go back to Gilgal for a little while. We need to find us a Gilgal. We need to find us a pile of stones somewhere. It was said of D.L. Moody that every summer he took the entire summer off, and this is what he said he was doing. I'm taking time to retune the instrument. What I'm saying to you that every once in a while, that is exactly what we need. Discouragement sets in. We get physically tired. We get spiritually depressed. What do you do in those times? You, you go back to Gilgal. There, there is nothing that will revive the heart, that, that will restore our hope in the Lord. Like going back to that salvation experience, going back to that period in our lives when God showed up, when God did the impossible, when there was no way, God made a way. When there was no hope, God gave hope. We need a Gilgal in our lives. We need sometimes, get this, to sit down beside a pile of stones and balls. This is where God showed up in my life. And if God will show up in my life here at one point, God will show up in my life again. God's not done. God's not finished. What I'm telling you, if God can lead them across the swollen waters of the Jordan River, God can do anything and he'll do it over and over and over again for his people. I'm reminded of John on the Isle of Patmos. He's choking on the putrefying dust of a depraved planet. He's told to pick up his prophetic pen and to write a letter to the churches. This is what he said to one of them. I know your works and your labor and how thou canst not say, bear them which say they are apostles and are not. But I've, I, I have somewhat against thee. You've left your first love. Let me just say this to you. There are a lot of people out there that say when you get discouraged, you just need to get busier. There are a lot of people who say, well, when you're not where you need to be, then you just need to get busy. Let me tell you, that is absolutely wrong. The heat of ministry can never replace the warmth of fellowship 
to Jesus. Maybe I'm speaking to one this morning, and that's where you are. Discouraged, backslidden, the fire of love for Jesus is not in your heart the way it is, and you're just trying to cover it all up by busyness, by getting more involved, by having more spiritual, religious activities going on. I'm telling you, if you want to be busy, this church can make you busy. We got something going on every night of the week. We can get, you can be as busy here as you want to be. But busyness is not the same as spiritual. You can be busy and not be spiritual. I want to tell you, there's nothing like getting beside a pile of rocks where God showed up one day. And reigniting that communion and that fellowship that you once knew with the Lord. There's a final thing and I'm done. Gilgal, a pile of stones. It is, a, it is a place of proclamation. I'm reminded in this fourth chapter that three times, three times God said to them, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? Someone said it's awfully hard to get hit by a truck and not know it. You can't experience God and not know it. Yeah, I don't know if I've experienced God or not. If that's, if that's what you're saying, trust me, you haven't. If you experience God, you know it. For the same reason a man that's been hit by a truck, he knows he's been hit by a truck. Someone also said if he survives, he can't wait to tell others about it either. And I want to tell you that once you've experienced the work of God in your heart, you can't wait to talk about it. So here they, they were at Gilgal, God showed up. You know, in the, in the book of, uh, of Exodus, it tells us about Moses going up on Mount Sinai, and he encounters God, and he has a visitation from God. And when Moses comes down from the mountain, his face is aglow. The people cannot stand to look upon him. He's been in the presence of God. There's the glory of God. The Shekinah glory is being reflected in the face of Moses. They had to put a veil on him. They couldn't stand to look upon him. Nobody said, well, where have you been? Nobody said, what is that radiance? Where did that radiance come from? The psalmist put it this way. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear, and yet will, will I trust in the Lord. You see, Moses and the psalmist, neither one had to convince people they had been in an experience with God. When you have a genuine experience with God, you don't have to convince people that it's real. It's obvious that it's real. We live in a day where Christianity has been reduced to bracelets and bumper stickers. Put, put, on a, put, on a, put on a bracelet. Put a bumper sticker on your, on your car. Let everybody know you love Jesus. Honk if you love Jesus. And, and, and we have reduced Christianity to uh, little snippets. You can't put Christianity on a bumper sticker. It is seen in a changed life. If your life is changed, it's obvious, it's clear. You don't have to convince people of it. Mo, Joshua said four times, three times rather, tell the people what these stones mean because they're going to ask. I'm going to ask you a question. What is it about your life this morning? What is it about your life that makes you different? If Jesus is the Lord of your life, what is it about your life that makes you different? When people see you, they, they wonder. He, he's, he's different. He's not the same. He, he doesn't have the interests that I have. He, he doesn't have the desires that I have. What, what is so different about him? There ought to be something different in the life of every Christian that will generate questions from an unbelieving world. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the people asked the question, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 16, the earthquake comes. Paul and Silas have been singing praises to God at the midnight hour. And the jailer said, sirs, what must I do? The problem in modern day Christianity is the world's not asking the questions. The problem is not that those are not valid and legitimate questions. The problem is they're not seeing what they saw on the day of Pentecost. They're not seeing what they saw in a jail cell in Philippi. Instead, they see uh, Christians wringing their hands, acting just like the world, blending in beautifully with the world. 
And there's no reason to ask, what does this mean? What shall I do? I'm telling you, when you've had an experience with God, erect there some stones. Let that be your Gilgal. You go back there. This is where I encountered God, experienced God. This is where I was forever changed and refuse to go back to the wilderness. Once you've experienced God in your life in power, once you've had an encounter with God, once you've had His touch upon your life, you'll never be happy until you get it back. I want us to stand together and bow our heads. In just a moment, we're going to give our invitation. This is a time for you to respond if God's dealing with your heart. God's convicting you of your need of salvation. This is the time. This is the time for you to come. Say, preacher, today I want to be saved. I want to become a Christian. You step out, step out now and come. Come to Jesus. Receive the gift of eternal life in Christ. You come. Others would say, preacher, I'm saved. But I've never been baptized. Why don't you come today? Why don't you come today? But the Bible says that baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. Come today. Obey the Lord. Maybe others would say, this is where God is leading me. He wants me to put my life in my letter here. Then you come in obedience to the Lord. Would you come? Our Father and our God, we thank you for loving us, for the gift of salvation. And we pray now, Father, for those who need to respond to this invitation, help them to come. We pray for the lost to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Roger Copeland, pastor of Northern Hills Baptist Church in Texarkana. We want to thank you for sharing in our services by means of television. Our prayer and desire is that if you don't have a faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that even now you would believe on Him. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, if you will acknowledge that you're a sinner, and in need of Jesus Christ, you can be saved right now by asking the Lord Jesus to save you and to forgive you of your sins. If you need help or someone just to pray with you concerning your walk with Christ, feel free to call on us and at your convenience, we'd love to meet with you and to share God's plan for your life and to pray with you. May the Lord bless you as our prayer.